All right, so um, let's just talk about kind of what we learned over the weekend. Uh, what did we get out of the videos? Uh, what cool new things did you take away from that? Um, all of that stuff. Just come off mute. Let's have a fun little discussion and talk for a little bit. It's like JavaScript, but it's not. I thought the separation of stuff, how he separated everything out uh, was really, I mean, it was, it was kind of hard to follow at points, uh, but it was, when you look at the end product, it's like, wow, that's nice looking um, is what I think like it, but um, yeah, it was hard for me to follow at points, but I thought it, the end product is really nice, crisp and clean. Yeah, it's yeah, and that's new world. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that like that MVC structure that he's talking about in that video, that's exactly what we're going to be using in this unit. So getting that early exposure to it is going to be super beneficial to you. Um, yeah, like at first, it is absolutely like wildly confusing, and you're like, why are we doing this? What is the point of this? Um, but at the end, whenever we you know get to the end result, like you said, it's going to look really organized and beautiful. And we're going to know, oh, I need to do this. I need to go to this exact location in this file. Um, oh, I'm dealing with you know this resource, perfect. I can go to the file that is named for that resource. That's exactly what we're going to be doing all unit. So it looks real scary and real intimidating at first. And it's like, you know, last unit we were dealing with three files. Like we had a CSS file and a JavaScript file and uh, HTML file. And that's, you know, what we did. So uh, now we're adding in tons and tons of files across tons of different directories. So it's just going to take a little bit of getting used to. You're going to feel like, oh my gosh, where are things? A lot, especially at the first of this unit. Um, but it all will uh, culminate into a really tight and clean uh, end product. So, what else did we notice from the videos that was fun? Trying to take notes when he would do like a whole part and then be like, oh yeah, and now we're just going to delete all of that and do it differently <laughs> was really fun. I have a lot of very randomly labeled things in here, <laughs> trying to like keep notes from like halfway through, a quarter of the way through, all the way through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's kind of how you're as like, we can't teach all of this to you in the correct way, like, hey, this is how we're going to be building projects using this MVC structure. Uh, we can't just like jump in and start from that place. So that's kind of what today and tomorrow we're going to feel like. It's going to feel like we're moving around code a lot. It's going to feel like we're refactoring stuff all the time. You're going to feel like we're learning things in new ways over and over and over. Uh, but that's just kind of going to be the learning process of this. We can't come in and say, okay, cool. Now we're going to throw this into a controller. And now we're going to connect this to a Mongo database up in Atlas. And now we're going to use a view and render it. Like if we talked about that today on day one, you would all like your minds would explode. You would feel gross and defeated and everything would feel bad for all of us. So, uh, Therefore, we had to introduce this stuff kind of in stages. We have to go and refactor stuff throughout this uh, so that we actually get to that end product that we want. It's going to feel real frustrating for these first couple of days. Like, uh, it's just how it's going to be. I'm real sorry about that. Um, but we are going to try to move through this refactoring period as quickly as we can, uh, just so that you, by uh, pretty much Thursday of this week, you will be starting to uh, essentially build up projects like we'll have for your unit project. So uh, that refactoring period is going to be rough, but it will be swift. So just so you're all aware. Anyone else take anything away from the videos?
He's pretty entertaining. <laughs> he is. Yeah. I'm yeah. pretty entertaining. <laughs> Anyone didn't like it at all. They were like, oh my God, I don't like any of this. Coding, I, I tried to code along for a lot of it. And there were times I got very frustrated, like with what Dylan just said. It's like coding along. He's like, all right, now we're gonna delete all that. And it's like, oh, what the and then you're and then you try and get your bearings as to okay, that and it was very helpful, but it was there was times where it was frustrating for sure. But mm -hmm. but I, you know. I see at the end of it, it's like, wow, that is really pretty. I will, I will say when he pulled out EJS, I was like, this doesn't look nice at all. It looks like no separation of concerns. This looks like really ugly code. I don't want to use EJS. Mm. <laughs> good, good. I like that, John. Uh, but, you know, we'll be using EJS and we'll separate it as best as possible for you so you have a good time with it. Uh, the, the part where your refactoring will happen, like David said earlier, I, I'm just going to say get comfortable with it now because you as a, as a, not only as a, in, like a budding software engineer, but even as an experienced software engineer, it is hard for us to think of every possible edge case, think it, think like go ahead and had, you know, you're designing like your room or your home and it's really hard to just like have everything down. You got to take it step by step. So like you and say you're moving into an apartment you move in your furniture and then you have to refactor, right? You got to to take the box out, take the stuff out of the boxes. Then you put your bookshelf by the door and then you realize every time, oh crap, the door opens inward and I can't keep the bookshelf there. But you had to put the bookshelf there in order to put the couch and blah, blah, blah around the house. So then you play a little Tetris in your house, right? That's essentially what you're doing with code too. You're going to have to put what's in here down. Say, all right, I need to accomplish this thing so that I make mental real estate to think about this next problem. Then I got to come back to this thing and need to switch it up again because I've now figured out a better way or I've now come up, there's another pattern here that I need to think about. So uh, totally be comfortable with that. It may, especially when we're teaching in a linear format like lecture, it may seem like, oh, crap, I got to go back and change that. What was that again? That's okay, take notes. That's that's be like focus is required this time around because even though some things may seem mundane to you, you want to pay attention, you want to recognize what's happening. Yeah, definitely. There's um and, and we'll you know get into this more, but like a lot of this unit feels like trying to drink from a fire hose using a plastic straw <laughs> for your brain. Um, and that's that's just how it's gonna be there is only so much that you can absorb so quickly. Um, like the number one thing I can suggest for yourself is not to get frustrated with how quickly you can learn. Um, there's, you are going to feel so behind in this unit. Um, and that's just how it's going to be. Uh, so you need to give yourself a lot of grace, give yourself a lot of compassion as you go through that. Um, I, I am not going to expect you, Shazai is not going to expect you, Hunter's not going to expect you, Sam's not going to expect you to know all of this stuff the minute after we give it to you in lecture. Um, also, there, you know, like I said, kind of in these first couple days, there's a lot of stuff that uh, you were, that you're going to learn that you know, you might not necessarily need to absorb and to learn. And because you've got this fire hose blasting at you, we're going to be very explicit, like saying, hey, this code exists. This is what it does. But you don't necessarily need to know exactly what this is doing right now. As long as you have this code here in your project, it's going to work. Um, a lot of times that's going to be how you're going to have to operate this unit. You're not going to understand every little line of code. You're not going to understand the like depths of every single function that you're writing. That's okay. There's stuff that is very important that you take away. There's stuff that is like, Hey, this exists and we need it, uh, to make sure that projects work. We'll be very sure to tell you, Hey, this is, you know, this is falls into that category of like, you don't really need to know this right now, but it needs to be, exist in your project for it to work. And hey, you absolutely need to know this. You need to be able to build this. You need to be able to talk about how this works. We're going to be very explicit whenever we're going through that. Because as I said, there's, you know, there's only so much your brain can absorb and we don't want you focusing on the wrong things. So.
All right, any last thoughts about the videos from the weekend? I have some random questions about EJS, but I don't know if I should just wait until we start covering it. Um, why don't we hold off? We'll be in EJS by the afternoon. So I, yeah, we can hold off on EJS stuff. So is this, the, this is the mean stack? Is that correct? This is min stack. So min we are stack. doing um, essentially MongoDB, Express, and Node. Okay. And then if you add in... Uh, Angular, uh, Angular or React, it's mean or Mern. Okay. Yep, exactly. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, I am going to share my screen real quick. We need a party stack. Whatever the acronyms mean, I don't know. Let's come up with it. Postgres, Python. Angular. <laughs> um, and React. I like yeah. React. <laughs> Tailwind. 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 There you go. That's what's the Y? What's the Y? Uh, YAML. I, I, uh, yeah, that's I uh, that I was is, gonna say I YAML. That's the only thing I can think. Of. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like the worst project ever. I know. <laughs> I have a it's split a Angular party. React stack. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> We're having a party here. I don't know what are you doing. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to talk about this unit a little bit. Um, I need to change the this week view. Ba, 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 ba. Guess what? It's a new week, everybody. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about MVC architecture, how this is going to work. Um, so we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but I kind of want to dive into a couple of specifics. So, uh, first off, what did all of us learn about, uh, node? Or you can just off mute, have a discussion about it. Basically just the backend version of JavaScript that you can use to kind of control a server. Or a cool. database. I like that answer. Not too bad. Anybody else have anything to add? It's written in C++, right? So it can be compiled down to uh, to computer. Or it can be compiled down and, and uh, yeah, it runs the V8 engine outside the browser. Yep. Does not have access to the document model in the browser. Yeah, that's a huge takeaway. So node we're dumping the browser so all of the stuff that you called on the window object before uh so like say for example we used prompt a tiny tiny bit uh we used alert a tiny bit that kind of stuff that is specific to a browser we don't have access to um if any of you like touch local storage or anything like that whenever you were messing around in the browser we don't have access to that anymore all of those browser specific things we don't get in node. Uh, we don't have the global window object, but instead in node, we have the global global object <laughs> instead that replaces it. So anybody else have any takeaways from node specifically? Cool. All right. Uh, we already talked about MVC a little bit, but uh, what did you all learn about that? You build templates, basically, that are fed data, um, and that's what's returned to as uh, that's what the response is to the request. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. I love that summary. That's pretty much exactly what we're going to be doing all unit is that, uh, hey, the user has, uh, you will talk about this in here in a second, a little bit more, but hey, the users made a request uh, and we need to take that request, get some data. Uh, we need to get that data back and then throw it into this view for the user. And then we need to send that view with the data in it back to our user so that they get the data that they were looking for. So that's real great high level 
uh, overview of this MVC. So uh, let's dive into this a little bit more. Uh, we won't necessarily be talking about all of these things as separate components in their entirety until Thursday. Uh, that's kind of how this is going to go. Like we'll start today a little bit with a router. Uh, we'll add in controllers and models tomorrow. Uh, well, we'll have routers and views, and then we'll add in our controllers and models tomorrow. Then on Thursday, we actually start throwing in a real database with MongoDB. So uh, essentially how this is going to work is our user is going to be making HTTP requests to our server. Uh, the, that request is going to hit a route that exists on our project somewhere. That route is going to map to a controller function that we build in our controller. That controller is going to interact with our model and the database to be able to get data back about uh, that route. Uh, so any data that exists that we want access to, we can call for that inside of this controller. Once we have it in that controller, we can then compose views with it using that data. So we can, uh, once we have that data in the controller, we can sit it along to our view. Uh, our view is essentially going to be for our purposes in this unit, views are our front end. Uh, this is where we will be, you know, uh, doing all of our kind of HTML like uh, stuff for our unit. So uh, with that, once it comes back, it's going to go into a controller and the controller is going to send that response with that view composed with all of the data in it. That is basically the big overview of what we're doing in this whole unit. Uh, so what kind of data manipulations are we going to be doing? Well, all of that is going to be CRUD. So we're going to be creating stuff. We're going to be reading uh, what we've created. Uh, we're going to be updating, and then we're going to be deleting. Those are the functions that we are going to be doing on data in this unit. Any questions about how this is going to work? Cool. So next unit, uh, we're basically, uh, as uh, Jahan has already pointed out, uh, we are going to essentially be adding in uh, React to this. We'll be learning the Mern stack. So a lot of this will still exist. We'll still have routers. We'll still have controllers. We'll still have models. We'll still have databases. But our controller, instead of you know talking to a view and composing the view and then sending that data back as an HTTP response, uh, this controller is instead uh, going to send the, the data that we get back uh, from our database to uh, the front end directly. And then we'll compose it using React. So that's kind of where all this is headed, just from a high level view. Uh, we're just essentially for the next, uh, let's see, six weeks, going to be taking this design pattern and building on it and building on it and building on it and building on it. So everything that we're learning in this unit is going to transfer directly into the next unit, except for your EJS stuff. But uh, if you're, you know, a, a lot of you will kind of have this love-hate relationship with EJS, uh, maybe a little bit more trending towards hate. <laughs> but uh, next unit, we will be adding in React. And that EJS stuff's going to go away. We'll be replacing it with something all of you will love, which is React. Is this so. pretty standard of what we would find in industry or like what we'd be doing in industry? Yeah. yeah. So this design pattern, the MVC design pattern, is wildly prevalent out in the wild. Uh, it's just you can model things di differently. And actually, whenever we move into Django, we will be modeling things a little bit differently. Um, but this design pattern is what like widely, widely prevalent. It exists almost everywhere. So great question. Cool. Any other questions? 
All right. How widely used is EJS in industry? Is that also something that you'll see a lot or no? Not a whole lot anymore. Um, EJS is a very, very legacy technology. Uh, I would say like probably the most prevalent place you'll see it or template engines like it would be, um, I, I can think of like a lot of government stuff that works with this, that would have existing structures um that use like ejs um that's and even that is becoming more phased out as time moves on so that's you know and shazad can speak a little bit more to this but you're not really going to wind up seeing a ton of ejs on the wild yeah for what sure what was it replaced with mostly with like a front end library or framework like a react or angular um, the places where you'll see EJS, uh, where it could be a job for you to take EJS code and refactor it into React code, which is why you're learning EJS, so you are aware, you know, just the tail end of it. Um, healthcare, uh, clinics, uh, car dealerships, uh, real estate, uh, basically a lot of those, a lot of the industries that you like don't necessarily update their code base every three years we'll still have some ejs hanging out but most people every two to three years will like have a nice fine update for their front end right and so uh i have seen people get jobs where they're like their job was to refactor an old uh styling engine like ejs or pug into react that's a big project it's a lot of work uh but it's a cool job because you'll get to really, really dissect and like break on the view side of the MVC pattern. So that's usually what, you know, front end thinking is like one, having the architectural understanding and then also being able to really focus on the views. Yeah, and like we really use, um, you know, EJS as a uh, mechanism to get you to be able to display something on a screen in this unit. Uh, if we, you know, don't teach you any kind of, you know, view solution at all, you're kind of left with, okay, cool. I'm, I have this data that exists in a terminal and cool. Uh, but the, you know, by using EJS and stuff, stuff like that, we're able to, you know, get something on a screen, this unit in a browser. So also kind of the reasoning behind teaching you a little bit of EJS. All right. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about uh, this min stack uh, and how these flows work. So we have this browser event, which generates our requests, talks to a router, talks to a controller, uh, interacts with the model to be able to get data from a database sends all that stuff back to our controller. And then we get a, uh, we send that data over to our view where it's composed and it's sent back to the browser. Again, that's the flow of this unit. To do all of this stuff, uh, eventually we will uh, on Thursday get to a flow. So, this flow is going to be this kind of mechanical thing that you do to be able to compose views, to be able to hook up controllers, to be able to make routes, to be able to uh, make sure you are getting the correct data from your model, all of that stuff. We're going to have this flow for everything that we do. Uh, and that is essentially uh, the five steps that are here. So uh, this flow, we are going to be starting with the UI. Uh, what method is the data going to be sent to our, our what data, sorry, what uh, method is the request going to be sent to our server? Uh, so are we submitting a form? Is there a link that the user is clicking? What uh, is going on for that HTTP request to be submitted? And then, we are going to identify routes that will handle those requests. So uh, the route is going to uh, essentially say, hey, I want to call on this controller function whenever uh, we've got a HTTP request on this route. And then our controller functions 
are going to handle those requests. Uh, that's where the bulk of the functionality for everything that you do is, is inside of those controller functions. Uh, so that those controller functions are going to use uh, a cool technology, which we're going to learn about on Thursday called Mongoose uh, to access the database and perform the tasks that uh, we want to get done. Whether that is creating data, reading data, updating data, or deleting data. And then uh, within that same controller function, we're going to make our HTTP response. Uh, if we got any data uh, from our database, then we're going to pass that along to a view. Uh, that view is going to be composed. And uh, once we have the view composed, we're going to send the completed view back to our user as uh, the HTTP response. All right. So, um, so when watching the video, I didn't 100% get it. What exactly is the difference between MongoDB and Mongoose? Uh, so great question. MongoDB is essentially the, uh, it's what we're going to be holding our data in is the MongoDB. That's where the data is actually stored. Uh, Mongoose is what we are going to be using to interact with MongoDB. So, okay, so DB is just like stands for database. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, so our Mong, uh, mongoose is going to be this model, essentially. We're going to compose mongoose models, or those will be composed using schemas, actually. Uh, and again, we'll get into that a little bit more on Thursday, unpack what all that means. Uh, but this uh, model is essentially going to be a mongoose model. And that is what uh, we'll do all of our database work. We'll be calling mongoose methods uh, to be able to uh, interact with this database. All that stuff will be controlled through this model. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about MongoDB, uh, I believe, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, so with that, uh, essentially, it is a document-based uh, database. Uh, we don't necessarily need to have a schema when we interact with it. Uh, MongoDB will basically accept any data that we throw up at it. And it's going to be like, okay, cool, I've got data. That's great. Thank you for this data. And it's going to throw it into a database. Um, what we need Mongoose for is essentially to provide some sort of structure for ourselves. Uh, the While, you know, there's absolutely a use case for having a schema list database. Uh, for our purposes, what we're going to be doing in class and to keep things a little bit easier for us as we're learning things, it's going to be necessary for us to have schemas. Uh, so those schemas are kind of defining what our data is going to be, defining what our data looks like, defining, hey, is this uh, field going to be a string? Uh, what uh, about this, uh, you know, if say we have a date or something like that, what are valid date ranges for this date? Stuff like that is going to be what we need our model for, Mongoose. Great question. Uh, any other questions about any of this so far? Okay, cool. So I'm going to show you all a the directory structure of a completed project. Please don't freak out, uh, especially if you haven't watched the videos. This is going to be like a like this is where you're going to hit your first wall in this unit. Is like, oh my gosh, can I do this? I like what is going on? What is happening? Uh, so this uh, right here is a uh, completed uh, project that we will build later on in this unit. So uh, let's break this down a little bit. And actually, why is this not? I can't like interact with this at all. What's going on? Zero UI. OK, cool. 
here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, cool. So, uh, essentially, all of these things that we've talked about before are going to live in separate directories. So you can see here, uh, we have our controllers in a directory. We've got models as a directory. We have routes as a directory. Uh, we've got our different views as a directory. Cool. So uh, what are we putting into this view? What is dog? What is this cat's router? Like, what are these different things? So these are resources. So we could see here, for example, that we have like a dog's resource. This dog's resource, everything related to this dog's resource is going to exist in our controllers. It's going to exist in a model. It's going to exist in a route. It's going to exist in a view. So uh, this dog's resource is only going to house things related to our dogs that we've got. So we'll have a bunch of different routes for dogs. And then this dogs, the things in this dogs route are going to call on this dogs controller. Uh, this dogs controller is going to interact with our dog model. And then whenever we get data back from our dog, uh, we have a, what is called an index. Uh, we've got a show. We've got a new, we've got update, we have my dogs. We have like all of these different views related to this dog's resource. So you can see, again, this is what we're going to be building by the end of the unit. This is a preview of how this is going to look whenever we get to the end. But all of our stuff is super organized when we're thinking about this. We're, you know, coming in and we are going to have, for every resource, we're going to have these different files that exist for that resource that deal specifically with only that resource. Uh, you can see there's a few other files in here. I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, but that's kind of what I want you to get out of this. We're building out this directory structure uh, to be able to know where things are. And I know like right now, this can look wildly overwhelming. It can look wildly confusing. But by the end of this unit, you're going to be really, 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 really good at navigating around these different locations. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about what all of these files are. And then we'll wrap this up. And then Shazad will talk to you a little bit more about Node. So um, we'll also be using uh, basically a template that we'll be working off of. Uh, we used to use this, uh, and we'll show you this a little bit tomorrow. We used to use a cool little uh, basically command line application called, uh, called Express Generator. And it would go through and it would build out most of this project for you. Uh, it would use that EJS view engine. It would do all these like different things that would set up this directory structure for you. Uh, the problem is, is that Express Generator hasn't been updated in a couple of years now. It uses some really outdated technology inside of it. You'll like, we'll go through and uh, build out a project with it tomorrow, but you'll see that it uses var everywhere instead of const. Uh, it uses required statements instead of import statements. Uh, we'll be learning how to do import stuff instead of require. Uh, we'll again, talk a little bit more about that later on today. Uh, but essentially we're going to be, for our uses, we're going to be cloning down a Git repository that has a lot of this stuff already built out for you instead. Uh, so that's kind of how we're going to be structuring our stuff for this unit, just so we don't have to like go back and refactor a bunch of code that like Express Generator is giving us. Uh, that'll keep us all using best practices. And that will keep us a little bit more organized and a little bit happier. So we're not like having to rename a bunch of files every time we start projects, all that kind of stuff. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this file structure. So uh, again, just like last unit, you'll have a root directory for your project, which holds the contents of your project. 
at, is the same. Uh, we will have this bin file. Uh, so that's going to hold all of our startup scripts for our application. Uh, inside of that, we're going to have a www file. Uh, it starts up an HTTP server, and it's going to select a port for that to listen on. Uh, that www file interacts very heavily with this server.js file. Uh, this server.js is kind of like the beating heart of your uh, of your application. This is where all of your uh, requests to your server are processed through, is this server.js file. This server.js file is going to execute for every single request that you get to your server. Uh, so uh, Shazad is going to talk a little bit about uh, how middleware works with that. Um, it's, that server.js is going to be responsible for also configuring your server. It's going to handle uh, errors. It's going to specify your view engine. It's going to specify the path to stack. Like there's so much that goes on inside the server.js. We'll talk a little bit about it as we move through this unit. Um, a lot of the stuff you're going, that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the area that you are going to notice that, hey, like, I don't necessarily know what is going on in every single line of this code, but it exists and makes my project run. Uh, so there's definitely some stuff in here that like you're going to glance through and, you know, and make sure that it's in the right order, make sure that it is uh, all there. But uh, for the most part, you aren't going to need to necessarily understand every single line of what this server.js file does. Uh, part of what this server.js does is call on our routes. So the routes exist, and that server.js is middleware. Uh, again, Shazad will talk a little bit about that in a second. But uh, that route middleware is going to be calling on our routes. Uh, so for again, with that, those routes are going to uh, essentially be responsible for calling the correct controller function. Quick question, uh, David. Yeah. In, just as this reflects uh, in the videos we watched, in those Net Ninja videos, are, would uh, what you're calling server.js, did he call that app.js? Is that the? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Good That's catch. Nice. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you'll, so we call that server.js because next unit will be moving to use a more, since we're using uh, React on top of this, that is going to essentially be our app. Uh, whereas this makes sense to call a server instead. Uh, so that's kind of the delineation between like, hey, it's called app over there, but we're calling it server. That's why we're calling it servers, because eventually we're going to take the knowledge from this uh, and transfer it into React. So um, again, we've talked about controllers and models a little bit. Um, let's talk about some of the other stuff in here. So what we haven't touched on is like this config file or config directory. So that holds the configuration files for our different modules. Uh, so our database.js is what configures our database link. And uh, that is what's going to connect us to MongoDB. Uh, either eventually we will uh, connect uh, up to a cloud database, or we could also connect to a local database with this database.js file as well. And then we'll also include this uh, passport.js whenever we learn uh, our authentication strategy next Monday. Uh, we also have this cool little node modules directory. Uh, so this is where we are uh, going to be placing all of the dependencies for our project. Uh, these will be all the directories inside of this. Every, everything is going to be automatically created for us. We aren't going to want to touch with the files in this directory at all. Uh, feel free to browse them, kind of see what's going on in all of this stuff. I like, I would encourage that if you're feeling like, hey, I really want to get a deep understanding for what's going on here. All of the code that your project relies on is, is inside of this node modules. So if you want to mess around with that, feel free. 
Uh, also, feel free to never open this directory ever. <laughs> uh, I would encourage you at some point to, you know, like some point in your career, you will open a node modules directory. Uh, but if the rest of this stuff is overwhelming you right now, feel free to completely ignore this directory. <laughs> Uh, we'll also have a public directory. So that's where our static files will go. Uh, so uh, we can throw our media assets in here. We can hold style sheets in here. We can also throw like JavaScript uh, files in here as well that we want uh, to attach to our different views that we send along. Uh, so if we want to have access to the DOM and that kind of stuff, uh, we're able to have JavaScript files in our public directory as well. Uh, so this is where all of that kind of stuff would get attached. We'll talk a little bit about that. We don't necessarily dive deep into, hey, this is like, uh, these are JavaScript files that you know we uh, want to be able to manipulate the DOM with in this unit. We will touch on how to do it. If you decide to go in that route, you might need to for a couple of things. Uh, but overall, you really shouldn't need to uh, or we won't really dive deep into uh, messing with the DOM in this unit a whole lot. All right, uh, we talked about routes and views already. Uh, we've also got a .env file as well. Uh, you might be a tiny, tiny bit familiar uh, with the .env from your very first lab that you did as part of this course. Uh, these will hold all of the secrets that you don't want existing on github.com. Uh, so, uh, that's where we're going to put like API keys. Uh, we're going to put, uh, our different, uh, configurations whenever we're talking about our authentication, that kind of stuff that all lives in a .env file so that we aren't sending that up to GitHub because that's not public information. We don't want other people out in the wild to be able to see that. And since anyone can see anything that's up on github.com, uh, at least if it's public, we don't want, you know, people to be able to have access to our secrets. So therefore we're going to hold our secrets in this .env file that only stays on our computer. Uh, if you had a private GitHub, would you want to upload the env file or would it still be best practice to not do that? You would still want to not do that uh, because at any point in time, someone could come in and change the visibility of that Git repo on GitHub. So if, whether by accident or rather, or on purpose, uh, so you would still want to hold all of your secrets in this uh, .env file, no matter what. Uh, and especially if like for your unit projects, you're going to want those to be public up on GitHub. So uh, all of that stuff, again, like you're going to want it in .env. And you're going to want to know how a .env works. All right, and then uh, we have our package.json and package lock JSON. So um, these kind of bounce back and forth off of each other. Your package uh, lock.json is built off of the contents of your package.json. You aren't going to want to touch your package lock ever. Uh, there's no need for you to ever modify what is inside of this file. Uh, your package.json, though, you may modify occasionally. Uh, there's uh, some startup scripts in there. There's other data about your project. There's uh, all of the dependencies for your project, which again, just I was going to talk about here in a second, about how that package.json looks, how it's constructed, and why we need a package.json whenever we are uh, dealing with Node. So is there any questions at all about uh, this directory structure? Anything like that? Very good. I highly recommend um, doing something with this, like saving it somewhere on your computer. I, you know, keeping it in a really accessible place, maybe printing it out if you wanted to. Um, I having this as kind of a reference as we start building out these projects is pretty useful, uh, just so that you're able to, you know, have this as a reference for yourself to kind of know what's going on if you need that quick little refresher. Like, hey, what is this controller's directory doing again? What do I put in there? This is good for that. So 
All right. Uh, so again, this is a complete application, so we will not be starting off with this immediately. So if this is wildly intimidating to you, that's okay. We will work up to a point where we are learning this. So um, eventually we will pretty much for next unit, most of this won't change a whole lot. Uh, but we'll also be adding in a source directory as well, an SRC. And that is going to hold all of our React stuff for next unit. So most of this is going to be pretty similar for the next two units. You're going to be dealing with this stuff for the next six weeks. So uh, again, you might not have a uh, like super grasp on this right now, and that's okay. You're This is going to be what you live and breathe for the next six weeks. So, all right. Any questions about this before we move along? Um, I have one question. Yeah. So the database dot uh, js is it like something like a uh, Firebase? Um, you could connect to a Firebase, uh, a Firebase database with this, uh, but for our purposes, we'll be using MongoDB. So. Okay. Yep. So the Firebase is like a outside uh, source, and then if you're do doing the database.js, it's going to be in your computer. Is that right? Uh, so we can really do either within this database.js. Uh, we could connect to whatever kind of database we wanted to. So we could connect to a Firebase database. We could connect to a local Mongoose or Mongo database. We could connect to a cloud Mongo database, which is pretty much what we'll be using after Thursday afternoon, I believe, is that cloud database for pretty much everything. It looks like this file is just a config information no no. So okay. it's not the actual database in the right. database. Okay. It could be anything. Exactly. Nice. Yep. Exactly. Nice. Cool. Any other questions? All righty. Uh, well, I'm going to stop sharing, stop the recording, and I'm going to send you.